What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of, you know? And Steve, I love talking about the challenge story. So I had Moise Navon on, who is uh, the founding engineer at Mobileye. Mobileye, they, their journey was, they were acquired by Intel for $13.2 billion, okay? They are fueling the autonomous vehicle a revolution. What struck me though was not that. What struck me was there was points in the journey and you could relate to this and we're gonna talk about, you know, I have Steve Adams and we're gonna talk about his journey, but what struck to me was that when we said throughout he had to take pay cuts, he had to work really long hours and we only see the end of the journey, we don't see the journey and he had to go back at one point to his kids and his wife and go, I, I'm cutting my salary we are pulling out of all extracurricular activities. We can't have any niceties. We can't go out to eat. We can't order in nothing. And that's like the reality of the journey. And, and I love hearing those stories because that's the reality for any business owner pretty much. But we only see the success after 20 years. So I love putting a spotlight on those things. So check out that. The founder of P90X talks about like some crazy things with him making money as a street mine before he, you know, took off and many, many more Inspired Insider. So check out those episodes. This, you know, this show is brought to you by and funded by my company, Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And what we do is we help B2B businesses connect their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And we help them by running their podcast. And the podcast, Steve, I tell people, it has to generate ROI because that makes it sustainable. And then you keep doing it. Even if it's a passion for someone, if it's not generating ROI, you stop doing it. So we want to make sure, yes, it produces amazing content, but it needs to generate a return and serve the business itself. Um, I think there's a bigger purpose for what we do. Um, I do consider this podcasting leaving a legacy for my guests and for myself. And short story, um, people can go to the about page to watch the full interview. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. And his legacy lives on because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him. So you can actually watch that full hour interview on my about page. And that's really what fuels my, my motivation and inspiration. Um, and I will never stop podcasting or producing content just for that fact alone um, of leaving, leaving a legacy. So if you have questions about podcasting, we've been doing it for over 10 years. Um, go to rise25.com, support at rise25media.com. Um, I am excited to introduce today's guest, and I want a big, big shout out to Eric Douay. Eric Douay runs Fair Merchant Solutions. For decades, he's been helping the hotel, travel, and grocery industry and other industries with payment processing, and specifically higher risk transactions. So check out, you know, fairmerchantsolutions.com. And before we started talking, Steve and I hit record. We were like, who, are, who's an amazing pe person in our universe? And Kevin Thompson came up and. Uh, Kevin Thompson runs Tribe for Leaders. So shout out to you, Kevin. I actually talked to you later today. Um, Steve. Steve Adams is CEO at Tiger Neuroscience, which helps decode and optimize human performance. What it is, it's a science-based approach to improving performance. Their formula is this. It's maybe probably, I guess, Steve's safe to say it's simple but not easy. So performance equals skill minus interference. So they want to eliminate interference. He's going to talk more about that. Um, Steve went from being the largest franchisee of a national pet supply chain to Tiger Neuroscience, which their mission is to contribute to the well-being and performance transformation of people. And they specifically help professionals, entrepreneurs, and biohackers. Steve, thank you for joining me. I totally appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, yeah. happy to be on the show with you. What are some of the things that allowed you to grow, um, maybe leadership wise or, uh, systems wise or hiring wise? What, what advice do you have? So I, you know, multiple things that isn't an easy, simple answer, but what I'll say is you have to be a voracious reader and learner because if you're going to grow and adapt, 
and adapt properly, you've got to have lots of input. So you got to read a lot. That's one thing. I, I read 100 books a year since I was 19 years old, 20 years old. And I'm 56 now. So you do the math. Yeah. Um, the other thing is um, you really have to dial in your, your, your core value proposition and know because you can't scale on a weak value proposition. So you mm. really want to validate that and know it's good. And I had help there because we had a franchise that was validated. Uh, and so, uh, the next thing is, um, you know, I, I didn't do that alone. I had two brilliant partners, uh, that were real estate guys. I, mm. my weakness was real estate. I knew operations and leadership and, and all of that in marketing. I didn't know real estate. So I partnered. So you, you're going to need to partner to do that. You're going to need to build investors. Um, you know, cause it, it to, to replicate what we built would have taken, you know, $40 million. Uh, of cash to get that to have the store asset base. Um, the other thing is, you know, learn leadership. You've got to understand leadership. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I developed a culture there with the team um, based off the principles of intrinsic motivation, meaning uh, everybody in the company had to have their own intrinsic motivators to be on the team. Uh, and that's what was going to give us the ability to deliver a Disney like experience in our stores. Um, I couldn't do that by fiat. I couldn't yell at people to do it. It had to come out of their own energy. And mm -hmm. we were successful in doing that. Um, you, have to, you have to know your numbers, uh, you, you know, and break down. Because uh, a business that gets that big, you've got to break it down into small pieces and isolate the economics of each piece and be able to understand that, how it contributes to the whole. And uh, that's probably enough. We'll talk about... Uh, thank you for rallying off that. That's, you know, it is a big question and topic. Um, what were some of, what are some of the leadership books that you have read that have been, or, or books in general in business or leadership that you have been some of your favorites? Uh, the leadership challenge, um, by Kuzis and Posner, mm -hmm. um, great book on leadership. Um, I really like, uh, good, to great, you know, it's getting dated now and older, but the concepts are still really good. You just got to ignore some of the companies. Um, yeah. The, uh, and then um, I like John Maxwell's uh, leadership work because he takes a squishy, complicated subject and makes it simple. That's his gift of a communicator. And I, it doesn't matter that he comes out of the faith community. Um, the man knows leadership and uh, I've used his material um, for going on 25 years now to train my leaders underneath me. Anything about intrinsic motivation? Yeah. Um, well, there's a really good book by Daniel Pink who writes a layman's version of it um, called Drive. Yeah. Yep. But the, really, the, the th there's three things you need to know out of that. One is you have to create purpose that everyone aligns with and buys into. The second thing is you have to create a path to mastery for each person in the organization so that they feel like they're growing. Um, and when you do that, that escalates uh, engagement. And then the last piece is you have to empower them. So think about it. If you, if they bought into your vision and you've trained them up, you got to let them go. And so that was the key for my company. I had store managers. We had converted them to coaches. They were basically life coaches. And we had cashiers writing $5,000 orders. Um, we had anybody in the store could do anything. And we were getting parents. We, and we had everybody do their own core values and mission statements and goals. And we would do monthly what we called uh, career builder interviews where we would talk about how they're progressing. And so we would have parents of teenagers ask us, what are you doing with our kid? They're so much more focused. And so really what we did was we turned our company into a success training company and mm -hmm. that led to great customer service, which led to growth. Yeah. All out of intrinsic motivation. That, I mean, I wrote that down in stars on my paper here. I think that's your next business book. Whenever you decide to write it, um, the title could be intrinsic motivation how you go from zero to a hundred million dollar company. There's your subhead in your title, possibly. Um, I think in book titles, Steve, for some reason. Um, that's really cool because that's really what almost seems like it's the core center of it because you can't do that alone. 
you need everyone to do help. And you also need everyone to have an intrinsic amount of motivation, like an outside Corvallis. They need to have like this intrinsic motivation to actually do it. I agree. You can't motivate anyone consistently from the outside. They've got to do it themselves. And I'm also against the superstar CEO kind of thing. It, it doesn't really exist. It's great companies are built where everybody's bought in. Is there anything, you know, with that process, like you said, you had a sales training company is masked as like pet supplies or whatever. Success. What are success training? Yeah. Success training. Um, what are, what's another aspect of success training that someone in, in their own company be like, what else should they do? What else should they implement? Where should they start in that success training? Well, you know, uh, one area that this is self-serving to me, but I really mean this, our yeah. first program is called Maximize, and it's not on the website yet because we're going to It is on the web. It's on step three. Max, oh, yeah. well, well, it says flow state training. Yeah. Yep. The, uh, so what that's about is, is, you know, and we have it step three because you need to have the other stuff out of the way first to be able to, to do it consistently. But the concept is you can engineer – flow into your life. You, it's trainable, it's highly researched, and there are triggers, things like autonomy and the challenge, uh, the challenge skill balance, uh, risk, different areas you can, so I'm going to bring it back to your question, is a company, of a, a leader of a company who wants to create a culture that wins can engineer this stuff into their company, not only their own lives, but they can engineer it into how they structure, how people work. So one of the examples is the, I have three people that work for me. We're a small company right now, but all three of them have total autonomy in their schedule. I said, you can get up when you want. You can go to bed when you want. You can work when you want. You can go, I encourage them to take an hour a day and go do something they really love outside of work uh, because there's pattern recognition and recovery built into that. Um, that's autonomy. So I've built autonomy into our company. It's like Patagonia does that. There are people, anytime they want to go surfing, they can. Yeah, I love it. Um, you know, do you, are you allowed to share the working title of your new book or is yeah. that still in progress? Uh, yeah, unless the, uh, we're pitching it to publishers uh, in June, they might change it. But yeah. my goal right now, it's decoding human performance, mm -hmm. the science of reaching your potential. So right now is de de decoding human performance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of reaching your potential. Cool. I'm probably most flexible on the subhead. I, the, uh, I really am kind of committed to that title because that's what we're trying to do for people is take a complex subject, decode it for them and make it simple in a way that they can take action on. What's the, um, what's the subhead again? The science of reaching your potential. Okay. The, the thought behind that is, is, is that integration of physiology and psychology. Yeah. I have a pitch for a title for you. Okay. But, um, I'll go. So I, when I wrote, what I wrote down, Steve, is and what people want, what top performers want, what I want is to get in the zone. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wrote that down because that's what you help people do. We do. Yep. You help people get in the zone or, or I, some version of that, right? I don't know. Yep. Um, so that's my pitch for, uh, the title, something in that effect is the end result, get in the zone. Um, that's what I want. Like if I read that title, what's that? Maybe in the subheader too. Yeah. Right? But if I read that, like, how do you get in the, the science behind getting in the zone? I'm like, okay, like sign me up, you know, yeah. okay. anyways, that's my pitch for you on that. Um, Last question I always ask, Steve. First of all, thank you. Everyone should check out tigerneuro.com. That's tiger, like a tiger, and then N-E-U-R-O.com. Check it out. Um, there's a self-discovery quiz there, um, which everyone should take. And just, just browse around, right? Um, not just for your health. What's up? All I would ask is if you're interested, you know, hit the free consult button. Um, we, we do an educational call. We don't hard sell anybody and myself or one of my performance coaches will talk to you and explain it in more detail. Totally. Yeah. I mean, for your sake, for your company's sake, but probably from your balance of your, your family life's sake also, um, 
there's two questions I always ask Steve since Inspired Insider. I always ask, what's been a low moment and how'd you push through? And then what's been a proud moment on the other end mm. um, on that journey? What's been a really challenging moment, time that you could think of and then how you kind of push through it? I resonated with that early story you talked about, about a guy coming home and saying no extras. Um, I have a similar story. You know, I left banking was a, you know, 31 year old kid that had a couple hundred million dollar lending division reporting to him. And six months later, uh, you know, we're losing money and have no income. And I come home and my daughter is, comes up to me when I walked up to the bedroom at night after I'd worked too long. And, you know, she's only like three and she gives me a hug and, you know, asked me where I was and why I was gone so long. And I held her and kind of got her to fall back asleep. And I remember just thinking, what have I done? I, you know, I'm sitting here broke. I can't even take my kids to McDonald's and I'm working my full tail off. And just six months ago, I had the world by the tail. And, and, um, but, you know, I, you know, we're all like that in weak moments. Um, but I, you know, I had a core, you know, my, I had a why I wanted to have an unconventional approach to time. I wanted to do things with my kids and my family that I couldn't have done if I was going to rise up in a big fortune 500 bank. And, uh, and, and so that was a low point. Um, yeah. probably. A so high was it, was it that core value of you wanting something more? That's what kind of pushed you through that moment of, cause it's like heartbreaking yeah. You know, when your child is like, where were you? They, they just shoot straight. Like, where have you been? You've been working too much. I don't yep. see you anymore. Yep. That type of thing. They cut right to it. Yeah. And, and so, yes, that's, that, that's what got me through it. Cause I knew, you know, I, I just needed another year or so and it was going to be fine. And it did, it proved out that it was, but um, that it was a low moment because it was the convergence of, of comparing what I had where I was now being exhausted and having this precious little girl who's now 26, you know, 27 years old, you know, there with me. Um, so that, that was probably, that was a low point. I have more, but that was one. Of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make this into a, like a, I don't want to make you cry on the interview. No. So I won't make you go through all of them, no. but it is. Yeah. Hi. I, yeah. A, that's the opposite of that, but it's related to the same idea was, uh, my son was a, a baseball player. He ended up playing in college as a pitcher, a nice. collegiate pitcher, left-handed pitcher. And when he was seven years old, he loved baseball. We went down to a Detroit Tigers, Chicago White Sox game. We're Tigers fans. And, I'm a Cubs uh, fan, so no, no worries about that. No yeah. Problem. yeah. And that little stinker, I was 35, 36 at the time, and I had never gotten a ball my whole life. His first game, the outfielder for the Tigers flipped the ball up to him in between innings. And he just thought, like, this is what happens, you know, at the game. <laughs> That's normal. Right? Yeah, so we were leaving, and I remember a Sports Illustrated story where it talked about a father and son going to all the parks in the one summer. And I said to Colin at the time, I said, hey, buddy, what if we went to all the Major League Baseball parks as a family before you go to college? And he's like, let's do it. So mm -hmm. we were able to do that. We wow. went to all 30, 30 or 32 parks. And so the high point for me was – uh, the All-Star Game in 2013, um, one of my vendors paid for two high-end tickets for the whole week for me and my son to go because they'd heard about our story. We had finished just earlier that summer in San Francisco. It was our last park. Wow. And so we were able to go. And um, it was, you know, that one kind of is a tearjerker for me because I think I can go right back to being in New York City and, mm. and the stadium and thinking about walking out of there for the last time and realizing we had done it. And it all tied back to why I got out of banking in the first place. Yeah. You could have that flexibility to just go into all these stadiums. Right. Yeah. I love it. And our family all went, our, the girls went to about half the games. Um, they went what shopping. were your top two favorite stadiums? So the all-star game is probably the culmination of everything. Yep. What were your top two favorite stadiums? Pittsburgh Pirates. Cause it's hmm. a unique place with a unique view. Um, at night, and then I'll then um, obviously Wrigley, but uh, it was between Wrigley and Fenway Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
That's the number one question we're asked. Oh, what are your favorites? Yeah. yeah. It's probably another book that needs to be read too, just our journey. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could also be actually part of um, intrinsic motivation. And the subtitle is how you go from whatever, you know, not going home, you know, having your son or daughter say, you know, where have you been to stadium, going to stadiums around the world or <laughs> whatever, stadiums across the uh, country. You really but, do think that way. But Steve, thank you so much for, I totally appreciate your time, your expertise, sharing your knowledge. People can check out tigerneuro.com. And um, just thank you again. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm very grateful for being a guest. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.